ago, we had an opportunity to really examine very closely how Christ's work on the cross was a substitutionary act. We talked a lot about that. We watched a video about that. I don't know, maybe some of you went to the site and looked at some other videos. I hope that maybe you have and those have been helpful to you. We learned, one of the things that we talked about was the fact that there was, for those who believe in him, this double, we called it, a double legal transfer where our record was put on him and he was treated as we deserve to be, but also his perfect record was put on us and we were treated as he deserved to be. So we were treated um, not as we deserve, but as, as Christ deserves. Um, and then he was treated not as he deserved, but as what we deserve. So not only was our sin imputed, we use that word, uh, or transferred to Christ, we talked about Christ's righteousness was imputed or transferred to us, and that's great news. Um, this means that his matchless obedience is credited to us as if we had never sinned. That's, not, that's unbelievable. What a beautiful gift of God. God treats us as if we had obeyed all that Christ obeyed. Well, that's, what a God. We looked at three basic lines of evidence also when we considered the resurrection. We looked at uh, the empty tomb, we considered the testimony of the numerous witnesses, and we talked about the long-term impact on the disciples. And so really, as a follow-up to the conversation about the resurrection, I want to begin with three unique characteristics of the risen Christ. And so that's the first part of your notes there, that heading for these characteristics. And so, sorry, Anthony. Yes, sir. That first one there, uh, talking about the risen Christ, Jesus is physical. Now that's contrary to what the Greeks or the Romans would have expected because in their mind, and we, and we talked about this some last year when we were going through the doctrines, but in their mind, they expected that if you were going to reach a higher plane, so that word higher goes there, if you were going to transcend this existence, then you would need to shed the body and move into what they called a spiritual realm because the body was bad and the spirit was good. So this idea of the resurrection to Greeks and Romans was just unheard of. Why would you want that in their mind? If you're really going to die and come back as something, why would, it, why would you want to come back in this body because this body was bad and the spirit was good? So the idea of a physical resurrection from the dead was ridiculous. Maybe they'd say there'd be a spiritual resurrection, but not a physical one. Well, Jesus, in his resurrected state, is absolutely physical. The gospel accounts clearly state that Jesus had flesh and bones. He eats a fish. <laughs> he shows his disciples his hands uh, and, and feet. He shows them his scars. He lets Thomas touch him. So Jesus was physical. So when we talk about the risen Christ, it, it debunks the thought of the day that if you were going to, if there was going to be even such a thing as resurrection, you certainly wouldn't do it in a physical body. But Jesus was physical. That matters. All right, number two, Jesus is ordinary. So that's not very nice. I'll explain what I mean by it. When the disciples on the road to Emmaus meet Jesus, they think he's just a regular person. In fact, when we looked at John 21, a week and a half ago at the Thanksgiving service, we read there of an almost comical experience. Peter and his disciples are out in the boat fishing, some of them, and they see Jesus on the beach. They're not going, oh, look, it's some strange manifestation glowing over there. That's not what they see on the beach. They, they see a person, of course. They don't know exactly who at first, but when they meet Jesus, they see that it's him. Uh, they, they come ashore. Jesus is 
got fish cooking on the charcoal fire. So here's the risen Lord of heaven and earth calmly cooking some fish over the coals. That seems kind of ordinary, right? It almost seems sort of homely. Like, oh, there, look at Jesus. He's around the fire cooking some fish on the grill. He was ordinary in the sense that he's physical and ordinary. He's not hovering. He wasn't six feet off the ground, you know, as if, and floating. He's not this dazzling light. He's touching, he's walking, he's loving, he's recognizable. It's just an ordinary situation. Third, Jesus' body isn't limited by the regular things of the world. So, yes, it's physical. Yes, he was ordinary in the sense that it wasn't, you know, just this <clears throat> enigma going on. But his body was different. It wasn't limited to the regular things of the world. Although Jesus' body is a physical body, it can go through locked doors and through walls. So that body can appear and disappear at will. Jesus' bodies, or Jesus' body, and our future bodies aren't going to be less physical than our current body. They're going to be more physical. Our future bodies are going to do more of what bodies are supposed to do. Okay, what our bodies are going through now is, is, is because of sin. The effects of aging, the effects of kidneys needing to be replaced, and cancer showing up again. And I mean, that, that's not how it was supposed to be. And so here, they, the new body is going to be impossible to destroy. It's going to be more perfect. We're going to be able to be and do and bear the burden of what bodies are supposed to do and be in a way that our present bodies cannot. Now, can I tell you what that's going to be? No, I don't know. We have examples of how Jesus' body was, so that's why I say we disappearing and appearing at will, walking through locked spaces and things like that. That's what Jesus' body can do. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul speaks about resurrection body, okay, in some very, not very detailed terms, you know, things that we want to know, and the you Bible know, doesn't give us room for that. There's a purpose in that. Some things are obviously reserved for God's knowledge, too great for us to understand. But we do know that this future body is going to be able to do more, not less, of what our physical, this body can do right now. Right. Be a lot smaller in the way. Yeah, I mean, it plays about having $90 animals, you know, you know, you had to be really smart. <laughs> sure. And, and yeah, to have that fellowship. Right. And, right. and, and yeah, it's, it's really unbelievable, yeah. but exciting. So the risen Christ appeared to his disciples and others over a period of 40 days before he descended into heaven. We're going to use Luke chapter 24 as our text to go a little deeper into the ascension. And Luke 24, before we read it, Luke 24 is, has been described by some scholars as a four-paneled piece of artwork. So you know sometimes you can have a panel here and a panel here and a panel here and a panel here. Sort of that artwork that, that can sit like this sometimes and you look at the different panels as you go around. Some would say verses... 1 through 12 of Luke 24 give us a picture of the empty tomb which the troubled women are seen conversing with angels. So that's the first part. Then you get to verses 13 through 35 and it shows Jesus' two followers on the road and their hearts are aflame as Jesus, unrecognized, instructed them about himself from the scriptures. That would be the second panel. The third panel is verses 36 to 49, and it shows Jesus' sudden appearance in the night that startled his disciples. And then you get to verses 50 through 53, where they see this marvelous image of Jesus rising in the clouds to heaven. All right, so that's Luke 24. You can see those different images displayed on a, on a piece of artwork. So let's look at beginning in verse 50. Of Luke 24. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, 
and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. Well, pause there. Flip over to Acts. Book of Acts. Chapter 1. Same author, okay? Luke. Acts. Same, same author. Beginning in verse 9. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now, let's, let's talk about this, the ascension here. This ascension took place as Jesus was lifting up his hands like an Old Testament priest. I mean, it's almost like he was blessing the apostles. Sunday, we'll be in 48 of Genesis, and, and Jacob gives his blessing to Joseph's two sons. Right, so there is this idea of the blessing. Why is blessing so important? Well, to have a nation, you know, God, God told Abraham he was going to make a great nation out of him, and, and you need three things. Land, people, and a blessing. That's, you need those three things to, to have a nation. All right, so blessings were important. So here's Jesus going up, rip, arms lifted high, almost like he's uh, saying a benediction over, over his apostles. And as he slowly ascended, he was calling down the Father's favor on them as he moved away from the earth. Now, the cloud that took him was the Shekinah. That's a visible representation. That's the word in, that, in your blank there. Visible representation of the pleasure and presence of God. So this, we, we often refer to it as the Shekinah glory. A visible representation of God's pleasure and his presence. That's the same luminous presence that Moses had encountered on Sinai when God covered him and uh, he saw its afterglow. You know, remember as Moses came down, the people, oh, you know, they just, they didn't want, they asked Moses, cover your face. Because he'd been in the presence of that Shekinah glory. It was the same presence that visibly manifested itself as a cloud by day and a pillar of night, a pillar of fire by night for the Israelites. Same kind of idea. So, I mean, so the Israelites had this experience in the wilderness uh, with Moses at Sinai. Then, of course, they had that experience when they were coming out of Egypt, this, this presence. And here's Jesus going up in that same sort of presence. It was also the same sort of presence that lay over the tabernacle and filled the temple. And so this, this isn't just something that happens right now at Jesus' ascension. It's been happening all along throughout the biblical narrative. And the disciples, understandably so, they weren't alive to see the pillar of fire or the cloud. They weren't alive to see Moses' face. Now a few saw Christ in his glory at the transfiguration, but, but here the disciples stand in awe as the Shekinah sort of drifts away and their dazzled countenances start to fade when they could no longer hear Jesus speaking. That's normal. Right? When, when a loved one starts to part, the plane backs away from the taxiway, the, the car drives down the street when your grands or your children are, are on their way somewhere, and you're not going to see them for a while, and your countenance sort of, huh. So let's look back then at Acts 1. You see what happens there as they're doing that. Verse 10, while they were gazing, Okay, so they're gazing, their countenance, hmm. Two men stood by. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand? So they're questioning. They're standing there. And then he says, this Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go. It would have been natural for the disciples to immediately feel the, a great distress, assuming that they had lost Jesus. Now look, in Genesis 49, or 49 or 50, it might be 50, 
sorry, it might be 50. We're going to see where once Jacob dies, the brothers all of a sudden think, uh oh, what if Joseph's going to get us now because Jacob's daddy's gone? That's immediately where their mind goes to. And that, that's heartbreaking to Joseph because Joseph's like, haven't I proven to you? I mean, you've been with me for 17-ish years now and I've shown you great favor and I've protected you here in the land of Egypt and, and it hurt him. He weeps about it. Same thing here as, as not in the same way, but, but there, there's great distress. It's like, oh no, Jesus is gone. Now what? thought what happens now that we're absent from him but the angels those messengers assure them that Jesus though gone in one sense is in another sense still with them on the one hand he's taken from you yet they stress that he's the same he's still personal he's still their leader he's still their savior therefore the angels tell the disciples to stop standing in other words, stop being inactive. The ascension means, and I, I put those two blanks there, the ascension means get busy. <laughs> Don't just stand there and look, get busy. Yeah, there's work to do. It means we have more confidence and excitement than ever. Because for now, our Lord is at large in the universe, working through believers until he returns. So his presence isn't just right there in that location with the disciples outside of Bethany at this point. Now his presence is with every believer everywhere on the planet. And that's supposed to be encouraging. Jesus tells us we're supposed, what we're supposed to be doing even us here in 2021, what we're supposed to be doing in the meantime, we are to be witnesses for the kingdom. Witnesses for the kingdom. We're supposed to be his ambassadors. We're representatives of the king. Well, what does the ascension mean to the church? First, for the church, the ascension, you know, because there for them it had this, this, this purpose of, hey, what are you doing? Go, get, get, get to work. For us, it, it has Jesus' exaltation in view. Philippians 2, 9 through 11, therefore God has highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name that's above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. So, Jesus' exaltation is in view at the ascension. What else does it mean to us in the church? It means Jesus' massive ministry to and through his people. He is interceding now as our high priest. That's good news for us. He offers his power through us. And he offers his spirit, which is how that power given to us. And so that was the next part, you know, we were in our, in our reading, the gift of the Spirit. Before his death, Jesus told those who were spiritually thirsty to come to him and drink. He promised liver, rivers of living water would flow out of them. Now, when he was saying that, he was speaking symbolically of the Holy Spirit who hadn't been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Jesus later said it was for our good that he was going away and he promised to send a counselor. He promised to send an advocate who would convict the world with regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. He would convict the world. Then Christ's last words before his ascension assured his disciples they would receive power when the Holy Spirit came. That power would result in their being bold witnesses of Jesus' death and resurrection. So that, when they're standing there, what do I do? Oh, he's gone. Oh no, what's, what's next? 
And, and, and the angel said, get busy. The get busy was, I want you to go and I want you to tell people about the resurrection. I want you to tell people about the, his death. I want you to know that, that this is real. Go tell the gospel. There's hope. In Acts chapter 2, let's read. Look what happens. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Edomites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Gia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in their own tongues the mighty works of God. This is amazing. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? Some would say this is the reestablishment of the Tower of Babel. Babel scattered people by changing their tongues so they couldn't communicate with each other. You know, this book did a good job. My kids still laugh about it, you know, in the, in the Tower of Babel uh, part. You know, it's like, I need a hammer. You need a what? You know, and he hits them on the head. You know? <laughs> um, but here, there's this restoration, this, this message, the, the message of hope is being told in all the different languages in the same place, and everybody's looking at each other going, how is he Galilean speaking my language? I they say, what does this mean? But others, it says, mocking, said they're filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. These people aren't drunk, as you suppose. It's only the third hour of the day. 9 a.m. Okay. Only the third hour of the day. This is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. So notice how he takes them back to the prophet Joel. Joel said, and in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I'll pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy and I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Joel said that. Men of Israel, this is back to uh, Peter. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Here's David. He goes back to David. I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad, my tongue rejoiced, my flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You made known to me the paths of life will make me full of gladness with your presence. So David's, you know, speaking of, I mean, well, David's speaking there of, of his Lord. Peter's trying to help them see, look, look, even David talked about this. Brothers, verse 29, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that were all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he's poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. 
For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. You see right after that, boy, that cut them, it says, to the heart. Tore them open. Really got to them, in other words. Vance Havner once said, we're not going to move this world by criticism of it, nor conformity to it, but by the combustion within it of lives ignited by the Spirit of God. While the early church had nothing of the sort of things that we think of as essential for success today, Many would say, well, we gotta have buildings and we gotta have money and we gotta have political influence and we have to have social status. Yet here we see the multitudes came to Christ through the power of the Spirit. The Spirit energized the ministry. Now, the Holy Spirit had been active prior to his arrival at Pentecost. All right, so I gave you, let's look at a couple of those things there. He worked in creation, Genesis chapter one, verses one through two. So the Holy Spirit worked in creation. He worked in Old Testament history. I give you the reference there, Judges 6.34. He worked in the life and ministry of Jesus, Luke 1, 30 through 37. The Spirit's coming was bringing with him two changes. Okay, so he's been at work in the Old Testament. But his coming at Pentecost brought two changes. Number one, the Spirit would dwell in people and not just come upon them. The Spirit would now be in us, who we are. And number two, His presence would be permanent, not temporary. So this promised gift, I'm going away, but I'm going to send you a helper. Okay, he was going to dwell in people, and He's going to be permanent. Pentecost was 50 days after Christ was resurrected, and just 10 days after His ascension. Jesus had instructed the disciples not to leave Jerusalem to be his witnesses until they received the gift. Well, the gift is the power of the Holy Spirit. So at Pentecost, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and then Peter was empowered to bring that amazing message about what was happening. And Peter, in his sermon in verse 33 of that chapter, said Jesus was exalted to the right hand of God. He's received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. So he describes Jesus' resurrection and exaltation as fulfillment of prophecy and God's foreordained plan. And he points to the gift of the Holy Spirit as proof of Christ's Lordship. It's proof. Ephesians 1, 17 through 18, Paul prays for the Ephesians. And in that prayer, he asks that the spirit of wisdom and revelation will enlighten the eyes of their hearts so that the Ephesians might know the hope to which God has called them and the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Does Paul think the Ephesians don't know that they have this hope and inheritance? No. Of course they know it intellectually. But Paul here says that the Spirit enlightens the eyes of the heart and shows us the glory and riches of it all. So then, Paul says in Ephesians 3, 18 and 19, the Spirit will strengthen us in the inner being so that we might receive power to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the measure, filled to the measure with all the fullness of God. This is the fullness of the Spirit's dwelling in us. To take the truths that we know, I, I put this on here in the whole thing, there's no blank. To take the truths that we know, like the love of Christ, and meditate on them, seeking the Spirit's help until we find ourselves with the power to grasp and we find the dimensions of God's love simply overwhelm us and fill us up. That's what we're asking to the degree that we have an awareness of Jesus as our righteousness and holiness before the Father. To the degree we're asking, help us, Spirit, help us understand that, that my position in Christ before God 
Spirit, help me understand the degree that will give me courage and love and power to obey God and tell others about Jesus. That's what the fullness of the Spirit is supposed to be doing in us, helping us as we read the Word, understand the Word, apply the Word. It's Paul's prayer for his people. This is what happens at every place that the fullness of the Spirit is mentioned. Anytime you see that phrase, the fullness of the Spirit, those things are supposed to happen. The truth begins to shine out. We hear God saying, you are my beloved, and it revolutionizes us, making us effective ambassadors of his kingdom. So our effectiveness isn't determined by our, our ability. Our effectiveness is found by the spirit dwelling in us that empowers or fuels us for works of ministry. So where, do we, where do we take all of this as, as we go? As believers, we have access to the power of the Spirit to shape us into more effective witnesses for Christ. That's great news. Access. You think about being in a special event, a concert, or something. You know, certain people can get those tagged or all access pass or backstage pass or whatever win them. You hear sometimes on the radio V Caller 10 and you can win a VIP backstage pass to see the artists or whatever. We think oh wow, we won something. We get to go behind the curtain. Here we have access to the power of the Spirit which is in us to help shape us and make us effective for ministry. I put a quote there from Warren Wearsby. The ministry of the Spirit is to glorify Christ in the life and witness of the believer. You say, what? That's a great, succinct statement of what the Holy Spirit is supposed to be doing. Glorifying Christ in the life and witness of the believer. How is this possible? Well, it's possible by the filling of the Spirit that gives us power for witness and service. That's what we've said. The Spirit launches the public witness of the church. That's what he's doing here in Acts 2. Because as you go to the end of Acts 2, you see that the church starting to gather in 42 and following of Acts chapter 2. So the Spirit is launching this public witness and he's making it, you know, in the, in the flames of fire coming down and, and all of that visible manifestation, people hearing their languages all around going on. That's a very public demonstration of God, the Spirit, at work. And that great public demonstration of, of some accusing, you know, of course, some were mocking. Others were perplexed. Peter stands up and says, here's what's going on, everybody. It was very public. And that was the launching of the church. As those people witnessed that, and then they went back home. They said, you won't believe what I saw. Oh, yeah, tell me. And then somebody goes over to Virginia, you won't believe what I saw. Tell me about it. So see, the Spirit showed up, came inside, changed their conversation, their ability to speak about things that they weren't necessarily aware of before. And then they went and spread it. That's what the Spirit still does today. Come inside, those who repent and believe, transforms us, working on us. Do cuss words still slip out? Yes. Does gossip still come out of our mouths? Sure. Does hurtful things said to our spouse or friends or loved ones? Yes. So we're not, we're not perfect, okay? The Spirit is continually working to prepare us so that we can continue to be more effective witnesses and ambassadors. So, that last little bit, it says in this new church that was launched there in Acts chapter 2, this new church was marked by praise of God, joy in the faith, and sincerity of heart. Praise of God, joy in the faith, and sincerity of heart. That is what we should be striving for in our church family as well. Those things. Joy. Joy in the faith. Is being a Christ follower easy? No. 
It's not. It is against the cultural direction of the prince of the power of the air that's ruling right now on earth. He has limited rule, of course. So it's not easy. But joy isn't a result of ease or not ease. Joy shouldn't be a result of peace or, or, or unrest. Joy is a heart condition. It happens that it's the transformation of the Spirit dwelling in us. So may we be that kind of church. It delights in the praise of God, with joy and with faith and sincerity of heart. And that's why we have little fellowships like tonight, so that we can spend time saying, hey, I'm going to praise God. What have we seen God do? We can gather together with joy and the faith to prepare the the space. We don't have to. Do we have to have all that? No. Do we need Christmas decorations and Christmas lights and all? No, we don't. They're a simple way. They're supposed to be pointers. They're not supposed to be the, the main thing, right? They're just supposed to help point to the main thing, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that our church family would